Our scripture reading today is very, very good. It ties in with our Sabbath school lesson, and it ties in with the purpose of our church. It's found in Matthew 24, verses 6, 43 to 48. The Great Commission. Yes. Luke 24. Luke. It is Luke. You're right. I had Luke. Right. I just said Beth. You're right. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. The Great Commission, Luke 24, 34. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled that were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Dave has our service today. Oh, special music. I'm sorry, I skipped that. Brian's going to have special music for us. getting old I forget words so <laughs> growing up in the church one of my favorite songs in the hymnal was lift up the trumpets and loud let it ring Jesus is coming again well, I would like to do that song. I've kind of written a different tune for it, but uh, just to make it fresh. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. Tell all your neighbors and tell all your friends that Jesus is coming again. Nations are angry, by this we do know that Jesus is coming again. Knowledge increases, men run to and fro, Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. Are you ready to meet him? Are you ready to greet him? Jesus is coming again. Coming again. Coming again, Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. Guys, give me just a second. I'm going to move this out of the way. Make sure I don't accidentally whack it. 
And I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see y'all. If that's all right. Well, that may or may not be true. But still, at least I can see with, if you fall asleep or not, you know, this way. <laughs> it's not just the eyes, Brian. It's the whole... <laughs> which uh, I'm getting pretty good at. All righty. So nice to be with you guys this morning. Thank you all for, for being here. You've got, you've got guests. We've got regular folks. We've got my wife on the Internet, along with whoever else. But I point out my wife because she just texted me to tell me that uh, her mother just turned 87. So I'm, I'm wrong about everything. <sighs> Except I was right about the text, but I picked it out. So there you go. Thank you very much, Carol Lee, for, for reading that. And, and thank you, Brian, for the, the special music. Jesus is coming again. And this is something I'm very excited about. This is something that is... Um, as, as we're going to dive into today, central to why we're here. Not just why we're here this morning, but why we're here at all. Um, but before we get started, we would be remiss if we uh, did not ask the Lord to, uh, to be with us. So just ask that you'll join me in a, in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, we've had beautiful music. We've had a time of prayer and praise and petition. We've been reminded that the work of the, the church moves forward through uh, the, the local church's needs here and also the, the goal of higher education that we have through, uh, through a couple of the, the great universities of the Adventist educational system. But now, Lord, we get down to the center of why we have the universities and why we sing songs and all that stuff. And that is you. And so, Lord, I just ask that you will get me out of your way and that the words that I speak are your words and not mine. I ask that you will send your spirit to guide every heart and every mind here and every heart and every mind that are not here that are still within the sound of my voice, even those who will watch it sometime later. People that we may not even know that we touch. Just ask that you take control now, Lord. And I ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The disciples of Jesus, and when I say the disciples of Jesus, I mean all of them, not just the 11 that we think of after, you know, Judas did his little thing. There was the 11 disciples, and then there were the others. And the Bible actually uses the word others, which are people that followed Jesus, that believed in Jesus, but were not part of that core team of people that we refer to now as apostles. They were in a state of shock, all of them. A, a confusion that was so intense that, that they didn't know what to do with themselves. They had followed along as Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a colt which had never been ridden, which, which is one of several hundred prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. They had seen that in just less than a week, five days from that triumphal entry, Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's put through a series of sham trials that led to his crucifixion on what we now call Good Friday, although there's a lot of good to be found there, other than the fact that it had to happen. But the disciples of Jesus were, I can actually see now, this is better, Disciples of Jesus were, were Jewish. And they had been raised ever since 
they were little children, to honor and to revere and to trust their religious leaders, to trust if the chief priest said it, man, that's it. But they had believed Jesus, they had put their faith in Jesus, and then they saw the people that they had been raised to believe and to trust obviously act unjustly and obviously crucify an innocent man. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to believe. This Jesus, they thought, was going to lead the glorious revolution and kick the Romans out of Jerusalem, but the Romans nailed him to a tree. And frankly, I want to just say this, and this is a topic for another sermon on another Sabbath, but when the church and the state get too cozy, the church has the state execute religious dissenters. It happened then, it's happened since then, and it will happen again. But again, some of the time. Luke was not a Jew and was not there. And frankly, that's why we're starting here in Luke. And in Luke 18, verse 31, you see Luke kind of give the, the disciples, the 12, kind of gives them an out, right? He doesn't throw them under the bus. In Luke 18, verse 31, it says, And then he took, he being Jesus, took the 12 aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all the things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and mistreated and spat upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him, and the third day he will rise again. You can click me another verse there, fellas. One more. One more. And it says they understood none of these things. And the meaning of this statement was hidden from them. And they did not comprehend the things that were said. Like I say, Luke's being kind of nice to these fellows, right? Was Jesus saying something that was, you know, complicated? No. Pretty, pretty clear, right? Pretty clear. Now, a lot of times when I read the Bible, I try to put myself in the place of the, the characters that are there. Um, when the char- you know, except for Jesus. I don't, I don't know. But if I'm one of the 12, I can, I can well imagine, if I consider hearing what Jesus said, I can, I, I can, I can think to myself, well, I, I wouldn't want to believe that. I wouldn't want to believe that I understood what he said. But I think that what he said would get itself stuck in my brain so hard and fast that I wouldn't be able to think of anything else. And like I said before, it's just a few days from the time that he said this until the time that it happened. It's not like months and years went by and they had time to forget it. It's just a few days. But the third day, which we call Resurrection Sunday sometimes, was on the early in the morning on the first day of the week that the women went to the tomb and they found the tomb empty. Now, John chapter 20 focuses in on Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John. You go through the Gospels, the accounts are you know, slightly different in the details of who exactly was where when, but the, the, the fundamental story is, is the same. <clears throat> in John chapter 20, you see that Mary sees the stone rolled away. She runs off to find Peter and John. Peter and John run back to the tomb. They stick their heads in. They see the grave clothes that are lying there. See, Jesus isn't there. And then John says, they went home. They went home! Is that what you would do?
I mean, maybe. What else are you going to do, right? But you know what they, what they did when they went home? They left Mary standing there crying. That's pretty awful, fellas, right? And in Mark chapter 16, you can actually read all these different people are having encounters with Jesus. And they're running back to the 11 and they're saying, hey, we saw Jesus. He's alive. And the 11 refused to believe them. Now, Jesus had just told these fellas, all right, guys, this is what's going to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to beat me. They're going to scourge me. They're going to kill me. And on the third day, I'm going to rise. Right? Like, call your bookie. This is what's going to happen. But on the third day, as people start to come to the 11 and saying, hey, we saw Jesus, they refuse to believe. So let's go to Mark chapter 16, verse 9. Mark chapter 16, verse 9. Now, after he had risen on the first day of the week, early on the first day of the week, oh man, water bottle, let's go. He first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along their way to the country. They went away and reported it to the others, but they didn't believe them either. I like how you, Luke puts it in chapter 24, verse 11, in speaking of the apostles um, in the NASB. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. The, the flurry of events that happened and reported to the eleven on the day that Jesus had risen, create the context of the, the, the verses that uh, Carolee read. From Mary Magdalene and the other women to the, the two disciples that were walking to Emmaus. Now, these two disciples walking to Emmaus, by the way, obviously are not part of the 11 if they went back to the 11 to report it. These are part of that larger group that consisted of of the handful of people that were followers of Jesus, but they weren't part of that core. Now, different people reported slightly different things. They all saw him. They all said he's alive. Some of them left it at that. Some of them said, oh, and by the way, Jesus said to tell you to go to Galilee and wait. What they did, the women, the two has a, 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 a theological and a legal term. It's the same both in theology and law. They bore witness. <clears throat> now, I really appreciate the two guys that are walking to Emmaus, walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It's about seven miles, and they're walking, and their heads are down. And they're, like I said at the beginning, they're confused. They don't know what to do. They don't know what happened. They don't know how to understand it. They can't process it. And they're talking it out with each other as they go along the way. And you've got to understand, these guys are not going along the way with their head held high, with their shoulders reared back. They are down. They are down as down could be. And as Jesus approaches them, and engages them in conversation. They responded, and they engaged Jesus in conversation, and as he asked them questions, they told him all, all the things, and so we're going to get into some of the details here in a minute. But if you think about it, these two were actually doing missionary work, right? They're talking to somebody that's not one of the 11. It's not part of the gang, as far as I know. You find out later he's the leader of the gang. But they're, they're engaged in conversation with a stranger about Jesus. That's missionary work. Everybody else was kind of doing like a, like a revival service. Oh, that was close. They're, they're telling the disciples what they had seen, but it's all internally focused. And, uh, yeah, you know. There's a few things that stand out here, and I want you to open your Bibles to 
uh, to Luke chapter 24. We're going to hang out here in, in, in Luke for a little bit. And uh, you know what? I think I'm, I'm going to have to go paper Bible today because that thing is too slow and we're running too late. Luke chapter 24. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you get to John, you've gone too far, but just barely. And starting in verse 13, we see these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. So everybody here, probably most of you guys know this story. They were traveling to Emmaus. They're just kind of walking down the, down the road in this slow lane with their heads down. And uh, verse 14, it says, they talked together of all the things which had happened. And what do you think they're talking about? They're just trying to come to grips. What, what does this mean? What do you think? I, we thought that he was the Christ. What's going on? So let me ask you a question. Do we have open conversations with people? about our experiences with God, about the things that we um, are concerned about, curious about, scared about? Or do we keep all that stuff inside? Just think about that. Whether or not it's, you know, an elder, the pastor, somebody else from church, or, you know, a non-believer entirely, are we willing to be vulnerable enough to not... Be, and this is, a ter- this is a thing with Seventh-day Adventists, because we've got all the answers, we think. We don't have all the answers. We have most of the answers. But because of that, we get all kind of, right? We do. Hey, you want answers, you come to me. So we think that if, we're curious, if we don't understand something, then it's a problem with us, and we're not going to tell anybody. Do we have the sort of fellowship with God? Do we have the relationship with Jesus that results in us having experiences to even wonder about? Right? These two that are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, it doesn't matter. They don't have anything to talk about if they don't know Jesus. Right? It's, it's, it's having a relationship with Jesus. And they could have been one of the 11 for this part because they didn't know nothing else better either. Right? But what happens? So, go to the next verse. See, that Jesus engages them in conversation. He kind of comes up to them, you know, he kind of, kind of pulls up alongside them, rolls his window down, and says, hey, what are you all talking about? Now, a lot of times, what I see people doing is kind of giving them the, the, hey, this is an A and B conversation. You just see your way on out of here, like we're back in third grade. So that's not what happens. They engage Jesus in conversation. Go ahead, go to the next verse. And the next verse. Keep rolling. Right? He says, you're sad. Why are you sad? What's going on? But they didn't stand with their backs to the rest of the world having that little conversation just between the two of them. When Jesus comes and, 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 and engages them in conversation, they, they bring him in. <laughs> and they bring him in with a little bit of incredulity, if you will. In verse 18... One guy says, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem that's unaware of what's been happening here the last few days? Really? The third thing that stands out to me about these two guys is that while their understanding was imperfect, they did not understand what had happened, their willingness to share what things that they knew and believed was absolutely perfect. Now again, let's go to verse 19 there, fellas. They don't know, who, they don't know that they're talking to Jesus. They, they know he's a Jew, that he's in Jerusalem for the Passover, like everybody else. But they also know that the chief priests are the ones that had Jesus killed. Which is why, by the way, the 11 are hiding out. They know it's them next. So these two are going from Jerusalem 
to a mass, some stranger comes up and says, hey, what are you guys talking about? Why do you look so sad? And what do they say? What do they say? Oh, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet and mighty in deed and word before God and the people, and how the chief priests and, the, and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Now, stop right here. You understand that when they say redeem Israel, they still have that secular understanding of what this means. Redeem Israel means armies, wars, kick Rome out of here, let's have our nation back in here. Which, by the way, is how the rulers and the chief priests got the Roman government to crucify Jesus for them. It's based on his claim towards of, uh, kingship. So, they know that it's their rulers that had Jesus killed. They know that this guy is somebody who's Jewish. They know that it could be them next. You think that didn't cross their minds? Everything was crossing their minds. What if this stranger turns out to be a spy for the chief priest, trying to rat out all the followers of this Jesus they just had killed? Fourth thing that stands out to me about these two is that they had a love for God's word. They, they knew the scriptures. They didn't understand the scriptures, but they knew the scriptures. And as they walked along and Jesus started to explain to them um, everything that had happened, you guys go to verse, uh, I think it's 24, 24, 25. Yeah, 26. Did call them fools and slow of heart to understand. But he says, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter his glory? Guys, don't you get it? This had to happen. And then it says that he explained everything about himself as they walked along, starting with Moses and the prophets. And later they, they say that their hearts burned within them. Friends, they knew their Bible. They knew the scriptures. When, when Jesus, as Jesus was explaining things, they recognized the verses he was quoting, and they started to kind of piece things together. And uh, bit by bit by bit by bit, they're doing a study. I mean, they've got to walk seven miles to get some time. And they're traveling up the road. And, you know, it's funny. In the in book, The Desire of Ages, it says that, uh, that these two men listened to Jesus and thought to themselves, I'm going to paraphrase it, you know, this is just what Jesus would have said. It's right there. It's in uh, chapter 38. Fifth thing that grabbed me about this story. They were hospitable. They approached the village where they're going to stay. And they're still talking with Jesus. They still don't know it's Jesus. And they're walking and talking and going along. And... Uh, you know, they're, getting, they're coming up to their exit. And Jesus is like, all right, fellas, well, I'll, I'll be seeing you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move along here. And uh, they say, no, 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 no. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's, it's late in the day, man. You don't want to be driving at night. You know, we get terrible headlights here in the first century. Um, well, why don't, why don't you stay with us? And he went in to tarry with them. Have you ever wondered what would have happened if they didn't talk Jesus in the stand with them? It's the kind of things I, I think about, things I wonder. And uh, in Desire of Ages, it's page 800, paragraph 3, if you're interested, it says, had the disciples failed to press their invitation, they would not have known that their traveling companion was the risen Lord. It explains why. Christ never forces his company upon anyone. 
he interests himself in those who need him. Gladly will he enter the humblest home and cheer the lowliest heart. But if men are too indifferent to think of the heavenly guest or ask him to abide with them, he passes on. Thus, many meet with great loss. They do not know Christ any more than did the disciples as he walked with them by the way. Now, this book was written, what, 150 years ago, whatever it is. So I'm going to translate from the formality of English at that time to uh, today of English. I'm going to summarize it like this. If you want to have a real relationship with Jesus, that sort of abiding relationship that will carry you through anything, you have to be a participant. Jesus is not a genie that pops out of the thing whenever you need him. Gives you three wishes, and the first two don't count. It's not an abracadabra magic potion. It's a relationship. But here's the thing. As much as Jesus longs to have a relationship with you, he's not going to force himself on you. He's not that, that friend that shows up uninvited and then hangs around way too long. He at least had to tell you a funny story about her, her friend Jessica one day. It was hilarious, but uh, not, not, not appropriate for now, right now. <clears throat> That's not Jesus. Jesus waits for the invitation. Jesus is polite. Sixth thing. And this is last but not least. I have no idea what time it is. I'm sure we're running late. I don't care. You don't care. Where else you got to go? Last but not least, these two had a sense of urgency. Right? Now, they talked to Jesus in the stand with them. And it says, you know, he says we went in to tarry with them. What they did is they actually sat down and had a meal. Right? And they were eating. And they're talking. And their hearts are burning within them. And it says Jesus broke the bread. And when he broke the bread and blessed it, and gave it to him, that's when they knew who he was. And that's when he vanished. But, they had already told Jesus, hey, it's getting late, man. You don't, you don't want to go any further. You, let, let's, you know, why don't you crash here with us? We've got to pull out, we've got to pull out sofa on the couch, man. You'll you be good. <clears throat> what did they do? It said that very hour, they got up, and they went back to Jerusalem. Now, they kind of been, I call it Eeyore versus Tigger, right? And you guys may not, may think that this is just you know, a terrible thing, but these two guys from Jerusalem to Emmaus are Eeyore, right? Their heads down. When they see Jesus and they go back to Jerusalem, they are Tigger. Right? They are just bounding back. they got to get back to the 11. And once again, they found the 11, and they shared the experience that they had with Jesus. So <clears throat> back in Luke 24, let's go to verse 36. And the, the, two, the two disciples are back. They found the 11 where they're hiding out there in Jerusalem, and they're, they're telling them what had happened. And right in the middle of that, Jesus, boop, appears. It says, peace be unto you. And then he asked for some food, because he had kind of like split in the middle of dinner before. But, understand this. This is right where we get, kind of get back to, to, to where Carolee was reading this, 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 read the text before the message. He says, you know, it says that he reviews everything in the Law and the Prophets and the Psalms that, that points to Jesus. All the prophecies, all the different things that prefigure Jesus, the, uh, the, the, the ceremonies, in the temple, all these things that point to Jesus, he explains it all again, and he says, you are witnesses of these things. There's two interesting, well, I guess three words, but really uh, kind of two parts of um, verse 48 that I want to I go, uh, go all like nerd style with you. 
You are witnesses of these things. Would you guys like landed on 48? There you go. Thank you. So <clears throat> these things, that, those two words, are, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Greek tongue twister that I'm telling you, the Bible translators just gave up and said, you know, we're, we're, we're going to call it these things. So, <clears throat> hutos, hutoi, haute, hautahi. It's actually four words in Greek, those four words. And here the Bible calls it these things. Now, in the day of school of biblical translation, so I actually did some research on this because when I looked at hutos, hutoi, haute, hautahi, I said, how does that turn into these things? That seems like a lot, because usually you get like one word in Greek and it's like a half a sentence, you know, in the English. So, in my research, and I, I could be wrong, but it basically um, was saying that he's emphasizing all the stuff that he had said, and then like re-emphasizing it. It's like, it's like, it's like, like for, for real. If you can imagine, like, um, emphasizing something before you say it and then say the thing and then emphasize what you just said. It, it's kind of like that. So I would translate this, I would render this up as, like, something along the lines of, now, all y'all are witnesses of all this stuff, everything, every little bit of it, every one of the things I told you, all of it, you're witnesses. Which then you go, well, why, why all this? What is the word witness? Same word is used by Luke for what Jesus said in uh, Luke 24, 48 and Acts 1, 8. And it's a much more easy word. It's martus. Martus. And it can be translated in all the different ways that you think of when you hear the word witness. Right? So like in, uh, in Matthew 18... When Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 19.15 on the evidence of two or three witnesses is the law established, right? That's, that's, a, that's actually the legal standard that the Sanhedrin used to uh, pass him for execution. Only their witnesses were uh, <clears throat> false. And uh, so that's, that's, that's sort of like a legal term of, of a witness. You are a witness, right? I'm going to call you to the stand and you're going to say what, what you saw. Or you're going to do what the women and these two disciples did. You're going to go back to the 11 and you're going to say, hey, this is what I saw. You are a witness. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a sense in which you can use this word. In Acts 5.32, Peter uses the same word, but he uses it in a different form. In Acts 5.32, it's sort of a, a possessive form where he says, we are his witnesses, which is... Not the same thing, if you think about it. We witnessed these things would be the same sort of like legal definition. When we say we are his witnesses, what you're saying is that there's a sort of a possession that ties what you saw, not to the things that you saw, but to him. We are his witnesses. And of course, if you, uh, if you know the story here in Acts 5.32, this, this is um, Peter and John, they're, 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 uh, they're, they're, they're about to, to get beat up and, and told not to go preaching this Jesus stuff anymore. And he says, you know, hey, we're his witnesses, the Holy Spirit is his witness, and sorry, we can't stop. We can't stop. So what do you think of the two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus? Good, good witnesses? Like the, those six things that I pointed out? Kind of make sense? Don't remember? Okay. Fell asleep? All right. I'm going to just kind of run down those six things again. First thing, their religious experience, their personal religious experience is very important to them. Two, they're willing... To, to, to add a stranger to their conversation. 
Three, knowing that they're risking their lives, they're still willing to share their faith. Four, they have a love for God's word. Five, they're hospitable. They don't just talk to some guy as they're going and then say, all right, that was nice meeting you. Have a good. They actually invite him in. And six, they have a sense of urgency. Their hearts burn within them, and they couldn't go to sleep. They couldn't turn in for the night and say, hey, you know, we're going to go find the, we'll go find the disciples in the morning. I'm tired, man. I just walked seven miles. I go, no, 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 no. I just walked seven miles. I'm about to run seven miles, so I've got to go back. So let's turn to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to quickly look at, uh, at Luke's second uh, recounting of the final events of, of Jesus' time on earth here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, save some time. I'm going to start in verse 3. Acts chapter 1. Jesus speaking of the apostles. To whom... To these, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them to not leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now this is where Jesus would do like a face palm emoji. Because he had been telling them for three years, this ain't about that. You've got this preconceived notion that what I'm here to do is go kick some Roman butt. Get them out of Israel so that we can have our nation back, so that we can be proud of ourselves, so that we can fall back into sin yet again. But that's not what I'm here for. But then what he said. I got to believe it's what he wanted to say. But I think he knew that uh, if they hadn't figured it out by now, they weren't going to figure it out until they get the Holy Spirit. So what he said is... It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white robing stood beside them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go. Now these fellows had seen some things. Am I right? And just as Jesus said, they were indeed his witnesses. And if you read through the book of Acts, you'll see some of the most amazing stories of the things that these guys did and said and the way that the Holy Spirit was moving. But it's here in the book of Acts that we really see the fullness of what Jesus meant when he said that you're going to be my witnesses. And you see it in Acts 22, verse 20. In Acts 22, verse 20, Paul is uh, before the the Sanhedrin, and he's he's kind of, you know, eh, they want to kill him. But he's explaining to them, you know, like, hey, I used to be Saul. I was your boy. We we ran together. And, uh, you know, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you my story. Let me, let me give you my story testimony, because I'm a witness. And in verse 20, Paul says, 
And when the blood is translation dependent, but what I want you to read is what you see here in the King James. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of those who slew him. The word there that is translated martyr is from the Greek martus. Stephen is a witness. Stephen is a martyr. Of the 11 apostles, how many were martyrs? Ten plus Paul, right? Of the 11, John is the only one that died a natural death, and it ain't for a lack of trying. So, the seventh characteristic, number of perfection, didn't even do that on purpose, just worked out because it's awesome, is that if you are a witness for Jesus, you have turned your entire life over to him. All the things that you think are important, all the things that are part of your daily activities, you give them to Jesus. And he will show you what's really important. You've been bought with a price. You are a witness for Jesus. And if Jesus calls you to become a martyr, will you? Now, that said, martyrdom comes in several forms. <clears throat> if you've ever lost your job for Jesus, I mean, it ain't like losing your life. But you've taken a stand and you've stood your ground and you've done so in a way that is um, based on your faith and your relationship with Christ. If you ever read through, read some of the stories of the martyrs, you go through like, you know, either like you go in, into gore detail in a book like Fox's Book of Martyrs or, or just read through some of the, some of the, um, uh, the history of the Protestant Reformation and you'll see story after story after story where, you know, like uh, Martin Luther, right? He says, I, I can't. He said basically the same thing that, that Peter said. Look, I know you want me to stop, but I can't. I can't. I could do nothing else. This is, what, this is what I'm compelled to do. I'm a witness for Jesus. My time, my mouth is not my own. You know, the apostles and by extension, the rest of them, they had this very political view of what Jesus' mission was. And they had this political view because this is what they were raised to think. This is what they've been taught from, from, as, from their time as children, that when Messiah comes, he's going to come and, you know, kill all the bad guys and stand up this great kingdom. And that is true. But it is not, it is true of the second coming. It's not true of what they were observing. And I don't think that it's a mistake that they still had this view when Jesus went into heaven. And they had to go and they had to pray for 10 days. And it wasn't until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes upon them that it changes. And all of a sudden they get it. They get it. This isn't about let's form up an army and, and you know, go kill Caesar. This is about let's form up an army of people that will go anywhere and pray with anyone, and will be a witness for our Lord. I can't imagine, I cannot imagine, Jesus has been crucified, has been buried, and on the third day rises again. He has already said, I lay down my life, and I pick it up again. 
He has told them numerous times. It's recorded. This is what's going to happen. He has told them many times, my kingdom is not of this world. But the first thing that they say, hey Jesus, that whole coming back to life thing, neat trick. Can we go over Throne Road now? Can we, can, we go, can we go do that? But when the Holy Spirit comes into their life and they finally, truly surrender their will to God's will, that's the time. That's when they change their focus from fulfilling the mission that they want Jesus to have to fulfilling the mission that Jesus wants them to have. And at this point, it doesn't matter that the Roman Empire is controlling Jerusalem. It doesn't matter that they're paying taxes that they don't really want to pay. The only thing that matters is being a witness for Jesus. And for the next 300 years or so, Being a witness for Jesus really means being a martyr for Jesus. They would take Christians, nail them to a tree, cover them in pitch, and light them. Because they didn't have street lamps. Because electricity hadn't been discovered yet. Let alone filament. But the political realities, they don't matter. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 2. This will be our last text for today. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 and 45. And I'll just uh, read it to you. This is Daniel speaking with Nebuchadnezzar. He's told him what the dream is. And if you're unfamiliar... Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. He sees this big statue, and it's made out of these different metals, and he has no idea what it means. He can't even remember the dream. He tells his, you know, his uh, big brain types to uh, tell him what the dream is and what it means, and they go, King, yo, bro, it doesn't work that way. You tell us what the dream is. We'll tell you what it means. And he's like, mm, no, tell me what the dream is. So finally, Daniel comes along, and he prays about it, and he says, okay, here's a dream. Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, neat, man, that is the dream. And Daniel said, now, nah, let me tell you what it means. And he tells him what, what the dream means. From the head of gold, the chest of silver, to the belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And then after that, he gives him all the details on what all that stuff means. He says, you know, the last thing you saw, king, was this big rock. And a rock had been carved out of a mountain, but no hands were used when this rock was carved out of the mountain. And the rock came and it hit that statue in the feet. And it just blew away. And then that rock turned into a mountain that filled up the entire world. That's the end of the dream. And this is the meaning. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And the kingdom will, shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke into pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. Daniel said, King, here's the deal. You're the head of gold. You're this great king. After you, another kingdom will come that's inferior, right? All the way down. Most of you know this dream and the interpretation. It is Prophecy 101. 
But I think that we forget that the end of the dream is the kingdom that God sets up. And when Daniel says, hey, in the days of these kings, what kings is he referring to? You know? Who knows? Come on. Somebody. What kings? Do we need to go back to verse 43? Oh, my goodness, people. Let's go. Come on. Really? Nobody knows. Jeff, we need to have an elders meeting. Carol Lee, we need to have an elders meeting about this. Our church does not know the prophecy of Daniel 2. We've got a little problem here. Verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron... The kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with the clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. All right. There are feet on the statue, and the feet have toes, just like most of us. And the toes, I don't know about you guys, I have ten toes. Now, my feet are really wide, and when I was a kid, I thought that I had been born with six toes on each foot, and that they had them, like, my, my, my extra toe snipped off. It's kind of gross, I guess, but I really, I actually believe this. It may still be true, my mother might have lied, I don't know. But, ten toes. And those ten toes represent What? Somebody, please. Europe. Europe. And the clay and the iron are mixed to indicate what about Europe? It won't be united. Has it been tried before? Right. We've got Charlemagne. We've got Napoleon. We've got your basic Hitler. We've got eh, Alexander the Great. Yeah. Um, Alexander the Great was before this, so it doesn't really count for this part, but I know what you're saying. We had the European Union. We've, we've, uh, we've tried a lot of things over the years. Um, they used to intermarry, figuring, hey, if I, uh, if I have my daughter marry his son, then we won't fight anymore. Come on, who fights more than a family? That's the dumbest idea ever. But that's how it worked. And it's in those days. It's in the days of these ten kings. It's in the days that after Babylon is gone, after Medo-Persia is gone, after Greece is gone, after Rome is gone, and we're down to those ten toes, that's when that stone that is carved without hand comes and destroys the thing, and it stands forever. And folks, this is an election year, and this is why I'm kind of talking about politics, and I'm not talking about politics so much as I am talking about what's important. I'm talking about what are we a witness for? Who are we a witness for? What is our purpose here? I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm not telling you to vote. What I'm saying is we're a witness for something. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. So if we are not a witness for Christ, if our life is not a witness of Christ and reflect that relationship that we have with Jesus, then our witness is fill in the blank yourself. I'm going to ask Brian.